I'm doing something today that I hardly ever do, and I don't know if I will repeat this anytime soon or ever. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. I brought a Bible lesson this past Wednesday night, and thank you. And I had, I don't know how many, it seemed like half of the, of the people that were in attendance Wednesday night, it may not have been that many, but it seemed like it was that many, who came to me and encouraged me to bring that, that message again on a Sunday afternoon for the entire fellowship and for the internet audience. And uh, I prayed about that all, all week from Wednesday to today. And, of course, the message is going to have um, more in it than it did on Wednesday night. But I'm taking the message from Wednesday night. So if I see any of you people that were on here on Wednesday night, if I see you falling asleep, I'm going to shoot you. Because you're the one that told me to bring this message today. You heard the story, didn't you, about the chicken and the pig? The chicken and the pig were talking about how wonderful their farmer was, that he fed them so well and he was so kind to them, and they were just going on and on about how much they loved their farmer. And they were thinking about what they could do to show their appreciation to the farmer for his kindness. And so the chicken came up with an idea, and she said, I suggest that we give the farmer a nice breakfast. You know how much he loves to eat breakfast. And so the pig said to the chicken, well, that's a great idea. What do you suggest that we give the farmer for breakfast? And she said, well, what about a ham and egg breakfast? (laughs) To which the pig replied, that's easy for you to say. For you're just making a donation. For me, it's a total commitment. (laughs) I want to talk to you about commitment. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, we'll begin in verse 11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was, everybody say it, committed, committed to my Trust. Look at verse 18. This charge I, what? Commit unto you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Look at chapter 6 in 1 Timothy and verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is, what? Committed. To thy trust, avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have, what? Committed, Committed unto him against that day. And one more, chapter 2 and verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same, what? Commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. The necessary ingredient that seems to be lacking by this generation, not just this generation of Americans, But this generation of Christians is commitment. It seems very, very difficult today to find people that are willing to commit to anything or anyone. The attitude is, uh, don't ask me for a commitment. Don't ask me to be responsible. Uh, Don't ask me to be accountable. 
uh, let me do what I want and go as I want without any accountability, responsibility, or commitment. And it's this way across the board. It's not just in one geographic area. It's not just in one age group. It's not just among Christians or non-Christians. This is a problem that we have nationwide. Very few people are willing to make a commitment to anything. But let me tell you something. Anything worthwhile, in order for it to succeed, there's going to have to be commitment. Somebody has got to commit to something or nothing is going to get done. Ladies and gentlemen, if we are not willing of ourselves to commit to something that we believe in, then we really don't believe in it. If we are not willing to make a commitment to what we believe is true, then we really do not believe that it is true. Faith without works is dead. It is one thing to say, I believe in truth. It's another thing to be committed to truth. It's one thing to say, I believe in liberty. It's another thing to be committed to liberty. It's one thing to say, I believe in the Lord, I have faith. It's another thing to be committed to the Lord with your faith. Now, I want to give you uh, three things today that I believe are going to be helpful to you, and hopefully we can bring in some illustrations that will help bring it home to you today. First of all, I want you to notice the object of our commitment. The object of our commitment. There has to be something that that we are focused on and that our commitment is focused on. There has to be, it's not abstract, it's not a generalization. It, it, is, a, it is a specific focused thing that we say, I am committed to this task. I am committed to this duty. I'm committed to this endeavor, etc. There is a specific commitment and target that we make in our hearts. The object of our commitment. Let me give you an example. We're coming up on Independence Day here in the next week or two weeks, I guess. And I want to give you an illustration of that by using the example of the 56 men who signed that Declaration of Independence. I hear so many people talk about them, and they talk about them as being uh, extremists or 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 fanatics, or maybe they were, uh, they were selfish men that wanted more money or more land. Uh, they were driven by monetary considerations and things of that nature. We've all heard those kind of statements made about the Founding Fathers. None of that, none of that is true. Let me give you some examples. Of the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence, 14 died captive of the British troops or as casualties of the war for independence. Many of them lost their sons in the war for independence as well as their families. Most of them, most of them lost their properties, their lands, their businesses. Unlike so many revolutions of world history that are, that are spawned by the very poor and destitute of society who have nothing to lose, they're so hungry, they're so destitute that they, that they insurrect or revolt against whatever the government might be. That was not the case of America's founding fathers. Most of them were wealthy, most of them were property owners, educated men, landowners, business owners, merchants, etc. Most of them had much of in, the term, in terms of prosperity and wealth. What did they lose? Let me give you an example. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planner and trader, saw his ships swept from the seas. To pay his debts, he lost his home and all of his property, and he died in rags. Thomas Lynch, Jr., owned a large plantation. After he signed the declaration, his health began to fail. With his wife, he left for France to regain his health. But their ship never arrived in France, and never, he was never heard from or seen again. Thomas Nelson, Jr. of Virginia raised $2 million to provision our allies, the French fleet. After the war, he personally paid back all of the loans, wiped out his entire estate. In the final battle of Yorktown, he, he urged General Washington 
to fire on his own house, which had been occupied by Cornwallis. Cornwallis had made Thomas Nelson's home his headquarters. George Washington did not want to fire cannon fire upon his home. Thomas Nelson said, that is no longer my house. That is the headquarters of the enemy. Fire. And General Washington gave the order and his own home was destroyed by the cannonade of the colonists upon the, the, the forces of Cornwallis. After the war, he died bankrupt and he was buried in an unmarked grave. Nobody ever found out where this great man was even buried. Francis Lewis had his home and everything he owned destroyed. His wife was imprisoned and died shortly thereafter. I, I, I preached a message not too many months ago about uh, some of the great women of the, uh, of the American Revolution. And I wrote columns about some of these women, and I gave some of the, the stories what they endured to maintain the Declaration of Independence. Not just the men, but their wives. What did they, what did they endure? Well, Francis Lewis' wife is one of those women. The British uh, seized her, incarcerated her. She became deathly sick. George Washington, through extraordinary uh, attempts to free her, finally successfully succeeded uh, finally succeeded in freeing her from the british prison but the prison had done its work she was so sick that she did not survive uh, even after being freed lewis morris saw his land destroyed his family scattered many of whom he never saw again philip livingston died from the hardships of the war john hart was driven from his wife's deathbed by the British. Their 13 children fled for their lives in all directions. For more than a year, they lived in the forests and in caves, returned home after the war to find that his wife had died. Many of his children had died. Many others were missing and never seen again. Their property was gone. His business was gone. He died a few weeks later of exhaustion and a broken heart. Of the 56 signers, Few were long to survive. Five were captured by the British and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes destroyed, and looted or burned. Two lost their sons in the army. Nine died in the war from its hardships or from enemy bullets. Many other men suffered greatly, as did their families. Among the 70-odd minute men, mostly from uh, Pastor Clark's congregation of the church at Lexington on Lexington Green, on 1775, April 19, uh, was a man named Jonathan Harrington. From the upstairs window of their home, his young wife watched as he was shot in the chest and stumbled toward their house. She ran down the steps, caught her husband, and watched him die at her feet. Janet Livingston, Montgomery, uh, Montgomery uh, Livingston's, uh, who was uh, one of the eight brigadier generals of the Continental Congress, was also killed in battle. Mrs. Montgomery was widowed almost before her honeymoon was ended. She made these comments regarding her husband's death. And this is a quote from Mrs. Montgomery. She said, as, I, as a wife, I must, in, must ever mourn the loss of a husband, friend, and lover, of a thousand virtues, of all domestic bliss, the idol of my warmest affections, and in one word, my every dream of happiness. But with America, I weep the still greater loss of the firm soldier and friend to freedom. This was the kind of commitment that those men and women had for the cause of liberty. Do you not find it today disgusting in modern America when we can't even hardly get pastors and Christians to do even the simplest things to fight and preserve the liberty that these men and women bequeath to us with the sacrifice of everything they had? 
talk to the average Christian today, the average pastor, even the average American, and you get a, a indifferent, apathetic kind of a, an opinion about what it's going to, well, you know, I, I would get involved, but you know what, it might, I don't know. I might, you know, I have to work a lot. I got a job and, you know, I don't know. I got a house and, you know, I, I got a wife and I got kids. And you, you know what? They had, they had jobs. They had property. They had wives. They had kids. They loved their lives and their families as much as we love ours. They loved that everything that God had given to them in blessing and in grace as much as we did. And yet they were willing to sacrifice everything for the cause of liberty. And there's only one word to describe that, and that is commitment. Commitment. Without that commitment, this country would not exist. Without that commitment, you and I would not be here today. Without that commitment, you and I would not be enjoying the lifestyle, whatever that is that we have today that has been afforded us in this great country. Without that commitment, none of what we know today would have happened. It was commitment that caused those women and women to do what they did. Think about the apostles of the Lord Jesus and the commitment they had to Christ. I don't know how many of you have ever done a study on what happened to the, to the uh, apostles, uh, but let me just give you a brief rundown of what happened to each one of these men. Some of these we know in Scripture, and some of these we know in church history. Matthew suffered martyrdom in Ethiopia, who was killed with a sword. Mark died in Alexandria, Egypt, after he was dragged by horses through the streets until he was dead. Luke was hanged in Greece. John of course, was boiled in oil. They tried to kill him. He survived. They banished him to the Isle of Patmos. He's the only apostle that died of natural causes, an old man up around 90 years of age. Church history says that he died preaching in the church of Ephesus after he was released from his uh, banished prison in Patmos and received the revelation. Um, the only man to live a full life. But can, can you imagine what he looked like after he was boiled in oil in the attempt to kill him? Simon Peter was crucified upside down on an X-shaped cross. James the Just, or James the Less, was thrown over a hundred feet down from the southeast pinnacle of the temple. When they discovered that he survived, his enemies beat him to death with clubs. This was the same pinnacle where Satan had taken Jesus during the temptation. James the Great, the brother of John, son of Zebedee, was a fisherman by trade, of course, a strong leader of the church. James was beheaded in Jerusalem. Uh, church history says that the Roman officer who guarded James watched in amazement as James defended his faith at his trial. Later, the officer walked beside him to the place of execution, overcome by conviction he declared his new faith in Christ and he knelt beside James to accept the same beheading that James took place, that James endured as a Christian. Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, a missionary to Asia, he witnessed for the Lord in what is now Turkey. Bartholomew was martyred for his preaching when he was flayed to death by a whip and then skinned while still alive. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece. After being whipped severely by seven soldiers, they tied his body to the cross with cords to prolong his agony. His followers reported that when he was led toward the cross, Andrew saluted it and said these words, I have long desired and expected this happy hour. The cross has been consecrated by the body of Christ hanging on it. He continued to preach to his tormentors for two days while he was on the cross. Thomas was stabbed with a spear in India during one of his missionary trips to establish the church there. Jude was killed with arrows when he refused tonight to deny Christ. Matthias, the apostle that took Judas Iscariot's place, was stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas, one of the group of the 70 disciples, preached throughout Italy and Cyprus. He was stoned to death. And Paul, of course, the great writer of much of the New Testament, 
was tortured by Nero and, and then beheaded in Rome in 67 AD. This was the kind of sacrifice that the apostles made for their faith. There's only one word to describe that, and that is commitment. Commitment. The object of our commitment. We must be committed to something. Find out what is important in your life that is worth committing to. And I got to tell you, if you think it's money and you think it's wealth and you think it's popularity and pleasure, that will not suffice when the hour of need arises. And you will find that it will never give you the personal satisfaction that you are seeking in your life. If you have everything you crave and God somehow gives you everything you lust for financially, materially, and in these realms, you will find that you will be just as miserable, just as unhappy as you were in the pursuit of those things. Because those kind of things are not the permanent, enduring principles upon which mankind can sacrifice his life for. It takes more than that as has been shown throughout history. Men have died for liberty. Men have died for the Lord. Men have died for truth. Men have given their lives as a sacrifice for the principles of things that were greater in value than what their individual life was worth. I tell you the truth. We are all, we are all expendable. We are all expendable. We all have a task. We have a duty. If we are looking at this thing in terms of what is best for us and protecting us and holding on to what we have, we are going to lose it all. We're going to lose the things that we seek and we're going to lose the things that are inside that make us men and make us women, that separate us from that which has no sense of morality and decency and honor and integrity. The only thing that gives honor and decency and integrity to the human heart is giving your life, committing your life to something that is worthwhile, something that is lasting, something that you can pass on to your children and your children's children. And let me tell you, it's not money. It's not wealth. It is the principles of honor and truth that God has put into the hearts of every man. Ladies and gentlemen, Members of Liberty Fellowship, those of you that are watching on this lo- on the internet or on this video, I challenge you, I challenge you to recognize that the commitment to truth and honor and right is the most important thing that we can do in our lives. Commitment. Amen. Secondly, I want you to notice that not only is there an object of our commitment, but there is an objection to our commitment. Look back again at chapter 6 and verse 20 of 1 Timothy. We already read it, but look at it. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. Notice oppositions, oppositions. There's an object of our, of our commitment and there's oppositions to our commitment. Here the Bible says science falsely so-called. You know, you know what that means, don't you? Any science, any science that contradicts, that contradicts the scripture is not true science. All true science corroborates the scripture. They may call it science, but it's pseudoscience. It, it is oppositions to, it is an opposition to truth. There's a lot of opposition to truth. Commitment is not commitment until it's tested. Hello? Until your commitment is tested, it's not commitment. Anybody can have commitment when it's easy. Anybody can have commitment when it doesn't cost you much. Anybody can have commitment whenever the skies are blue and it, it, it's convenient. Commitment is not commitment until it's tested. Until you have adversity and opposition, only then is your commitment proven to be commitment. Amen. 
I've, I've said this before, you'll hear me say it again. People will come and they'll say, Hi, right, Chuck, I'm with you. If you were there Wednesday night, we'll see. I'm behind you, preacher. Yeah, I, I know. I felt that knife. I know you're there. I'm willing to prove myself to you. I'm willing to prove my commitment. You must be willing to prove your commitment to me and to the rest of us. Don't just come and say, da 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 da, reinforcements have arrived. I'm here, you lucky people. <laughs> Forgive us. We have a right to see your commitment tested and to see how you stand up under fire and to see how you stand up under adversity to see you stand up under opposition we have a right to expect that trust is not given trust is earned love is given love is given trust is earned. I told you Wednesday night about that story, and I went, I went after it. I just came to me, so I went later, and I looked it up, and I, I, talked, I talked about Charlie Wilson's War. Charlie Wilson's War was a movie that was made a few years ago, uh, True Life Events. I don't recommend it for families. You don't want your children to see it, but it does truthfully tell the story of what happened uh, in the... Uh, in the U.S. Congress uh, when the Afghans were fighting the communist Russians in Afghanistan and the events uh, of, that took place and all that. And I, I know the, the congressman personally who now represents Charlie Wilson was the congressman from Texas outside of Houston that the movie is based on. And I know the congressman that took his place that is in Congress today. In fact, uh, I had the privilege of going down and campaigning for him in his last election. And uh, even though I campaigned for him, he still won. Um, and he's doing a great job in Congress today. In fact, uh, he is, uh, I don't know whether he's already introduced it or whether he's preparing, um, I don't have the facts on this, but I, I, I heard, I've heard that he's preparing papers uh, depending upon what, upon what exactly the uh, Obama administration does relative to some of these gun control proposals, he's, uh, he's uh, preparing articles of impeachment against the President of the United States. He's a, he's a real fighter, uh, this Congressman. And so while I was down there in Texas campaigning for him, I asked him about Charlie Wilson's War of the Movie. I said, how accurate is it to reality? Because he knew Charlie Wilson very well. He knew all the key players in, the, in that story. And he told me that uh, it was about 90% accurate. He said it was, it was very accurate. He said the only thing that wasn't accurate was the, uh, the affair that they put in the movie between Charlie Wilson and the, uh, the Texas uh, billionaire lady that uh, was the, kind of the promoter of, of all of this help generated to the uh, Afghan uh, rebels. Uh, that did not take place. Tom Hanks played Charlie Wilson. Julia Roberts played uh, the lady. So Tom actually went, from what I understand, this is all what I'm told, actually went to, uh, to uh, the, the real lady, Julia Roberts' character, and said, you know, they, they, the, the script writers have put in the fact that you've had an affair with, with Charlie Wilson. It was the course wasn't true. So, ah, I didn't, that didn't happen. She said, but that's all right. If everybody, if it'll help get people to the theater to watch the story, I don't care. I just want people to know what happened. <laughs> so they left it in. Uh, so, but anyway, there's a part in there where uh, he's talking to, to Congressman Wilson is talking to the CIA guy who's kind of the operative 
doing all this from the from the inside spook part of it. And uh, toward the end of the of the movie, they have this conversation. Charlie Wilson and this CIA guy, his name was Gus, and uh, they were talking about all the, the possibilities of what happened and what didn't happen and what could happen and it's good and so forth. And uh, so Gus, the CIA guy, tells Congressman Wilson, he said, there's a little boy, and on his 14th birthday, he gets a horse. And everybody in the village says, how wonderful, the boy got a horse. And the Zen master, going back to, to the history, the Zen master says, we'll see. Two years later, the boy falls off the horse, breaks his leg, and everyone in the village says, how terrible. And the Zen master says, We'll see. Then a war breaks out and all the young men have to go off and fight. Except the boy can't because his legs are all messed up and everybody in the village says, How wonderful! And the Zen master says, We'll see. We'll see. We'll see, we'll see your commitment. We'll see your determination. We'll see. It'll be proven. It'll be tested. We will see. In the winter of 1776 at Valley Forge, we've all heard the story to some degree or another. The men were suffering under the most unbelievable conditions imaginable. But has anybody ever heard about what General Washington himself endured? during that winter in 1776. General Washington himself personally was plagued with attacks of smallpox, influenza, tuberculosis, pleurisy, dysentery, and malaria. All of the above. Any one of those things would have incapacitated most people. But despite all of these ailments and maladies that he had, one historian wrote this about General George Washington. And he said, quote, We have no record that Washington was ever incapacitated all during the Revolutionary War. Close quote. Never incapacitated. There's a word for that. It's commitment. When you don't feel like doing it, commitment makes you do it. When it's not convenient to do it, commitment makes you do it. When people are trying to stop you from doing it, commitment makes you do it. When circumstances would prevent you from doing it. Commitment makes you do it. The thing that separates the men and women who do very little or nothing in the great causes of God and man are the people that have no commitment. And the men and women that do succeed in doing whatever it is that God has called them to do, do it because of commitment. It's not because of skill. It's not because of ability. It's not because of opportunity. It's not because of convenience. It's not because of health or lack thereof. The difference between people who do and people who don't, between people who are and people who aren't, is commitment. Liberty Fellowship, America, and our Savior deserve our commitment. been that way throughout history. Homer and Milton were blind. Beethoven was deaf. Alexander the Great was hunchback. Shakespeare, Scott, and Byron were crippled. Edison was, was nearly deaf. Fanny Crosby was blind. Teddy Roosevelt was nearsighted, half deaf, and gradually crippled. crippled. Jim Ryan was a natural weakling. George Handel was paralyzed. What a man is committed, what can stop him? 
Cripple him and you have a Sir Walter Scott. Put him in prison and you have a John Bunyan. Bury him in the snow of Valley Forge and you have a George Washington. Afflict him with asthma until, at the, until as a boy he lies choking in his father's arms and you have a Th Theodore Roosevelt. Stab him with rheumatic pains until for years he cannot sleep without an opiate, and you have a Steinmetz. Put him in a grease pit in a locomotive roadhouse, and you have a Walter Chrysler. Make him a second fiddle in an obscure South American orchestra, and you have a Toscanini, and on and on and on. The people that have endured, the people that have succeeded, and whatever their life's ambition has been are people that are committed. Without committed, commitment, we have nothing, nothing, nothing. There are two things that are going to test your commitment. Number one, time is going to test your commitment. Christianity is filled with 180-day wonders. They come in for six months, all ablaze, and then they burn out and go away. If you want your life to be effective, do it not just for 30 months. Try it for 30 years. Time is going to test your commitment. The principles of truth and honor and right the principles that this book has instructed us in and that the men and women of history have given us the examples of are as true today as they were then. They are as true today as they were when you first made that commitment to the Lord, to truth, to honor, whatever it might have been. It's just as true today as it was then. Time does not negate those principles. They don't, they don't wash away with the waves of time. They're the same. If they are not as important to you today as they were to you yesterday, it's not because the principles are not as important, it's because you are not as committed to those principles as you should be. The principles haven't changed. Those truths have not changed. The fact that we do not value them as we should is an indictment against us. It is not a reflection of the truth that is being ignored. We cannot judge the truth by the way men and women ignore it. Just because our courts and our politicians and so many of our pastors and leaders in our country do not show the commitment to those principles and those truths does not lessen them one iota. The truths are just as important as they were when Jesus died on that cross, when the apostles died in those sacrificial deaths, as when our founding fathers gave us their lives as an example to their posterity. They are just as important today as they were then. The fact that this generation doesn't value them or doesn't deem them to be as important, again, it's not a reflection on the truth. It is a reflection on the people that don't value the truth. It's an assault and an insult against us. It does not diminish the principle of honor and truth. If no one else in your neighborhood is willing to appreciate and stand for the truth, that doesn't lessen your duty to stand for the truth. If no other church in the Flathead Valley will stand for the truth. It doesn't lessen our duty at Liberty Fellowship to stand for the truth. Of course, there are others that do, but the point is, if we don't judge these things on the basis of how others treat them, we have to judge these things on the basis of what they are themselves. Time is going to test your, your commitment. 
time is going to test your commitment. Thirdly, I want you to notice the objective of our commitment. Look at chapter 2 and verse 2. Chapter 2 and verse 2. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Wednesday night I asked the people how many knew the name Amos Alonzo Skaggs, and not too many people did. So I'll ask this audience. How many of you know the name Amos Alonzo Skaggs? Nobody? When I looked, there were like three or four of you on Wednesday night that said you knew the name, so... Nobody... He was a, he was a famous... In his, in his time, he was a very famous football coach. Amos Alonzo Skaggs... My, my favorite quote of his was this. It doesn't matter how much the coach knows. It only matters how much the players learn. It doesn't, how, it doesn't matter how much the pastor knows. It only matters what the church learns. Not that I have a whole lot of smart to try to impress you with, but I, if I had any, I wouldn't try to impress you with it. I'm not here for you to walk out and say, wow, Chuck Baldwin's smart. Wow, Chuck Baldwin knows a lot. It doesn't matter how much I know. It doesn't matter how smart I am. What matters is what are you going to learn? And what are you going to do with what you learn? And I'll tell you something else. One of the problems that I think that we have in not just our churches, but all across America in terms of leadership, I'll use this illustration. There was an old 18th, 19th century preacher by the name of Gypsy Smith. Gypsy Smith was a gypsy, and he was converted to Christ. He became a great evangelist. Hence the name Gypsy Smith. He won many, many people to the Lord. Gypsy Smith was asked one day by someone, he said, why do, why do people come to hear you preach? Gypsy was not educated. He was not very learned. He said, why do people come to hear you preach? And Gypsy said, I guess it's because I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. There was another story about a small country church that caught on fire back in the days before you had fire trucks and modern day firefighting equipment and pretty much buckets and water. And the church was burning and people in the, community, in the town were grabbing their buckets and trying to put the fire out. And preacher found himself running with a bucket of water right next to a guy in his church that never went, I mean a guy in, in this community that never went to church anywhere. Never went to church at all. And the preacher thought he'd put a jab in at him. And as they were rushing toward the, the, the church building with their buckets of water, the preacher said, the first time I ever saw you run into church. And the fellow responded, he said, first time I ever saw the church on fire. <laughs> That's the problem. If I can just leave you with, with, one, with one thing, I hope I can leave you with, with this. Commitment is not taught. It is not taught. I can, I can try to teach you commitment. I can... I can give you all the chapter and verse and I can tell you all the principles and I can say here's, here's the outline one, two, three, A, B, C here's 
why you ought to be committed. I can give you all the precepts and the platitudes and all the points. Put it on a chart. Put it on a graph. Get my PowerPoint presentation. But it points you to all the, all the here's commitment. And for the most part, people are going to walk out with no more commitment than they had when they came in. Commitment is not taught. Commitment is, remember, caught. It is caught. It is caught. If you don't catch commitment, if you don't catch something from me, and I'm not talking about a cold. If you don't catch something from me, I have failed. You have to catch it. If as a parent, our kids do not catch it from us, they're not going to get it any other way. They've got to catch it. I, I have not been the perfect father by any stretch of the imagination. I have made a ton of of mistakes as a dad. My failures far outweigh my successes in terms of doing it just like you're supposed to do it and being the perfect dad and the perfect this and the perfect that and saying the right thing and doing the right thing. No! I haven't been. But I would like to think that the reason that my children are still committed to the Lord and they have a commitment to liberty and a commitment to truth is because for 20 years or so they caught commitment in their heart. They caught it. And they know I'm not perfect. And they know I make mistakes. And I disappoint them. And I let them down as, as we all do. I know I have and I know I do. But I would like to think that they caught a commitment to the Lord, to freedom, and to truth. And they are doing what they do because they caught it. I want you to catch my commitment. I want you to catch my love. The love that I have for you. The love that I have for my state. The love that I have for my country. The love that I have for liberty. The love that I have for the principles of truth upon which it is established. You may disagree about this or that, and you're going to see my shortcomings and my failures and my faults. If you stick around here long enough, you're going to see them. But I hope and pray that if you stick around here long enough, you're also going to catch something from Chuck Baldwin. I want you to catch my commitment. I want you to catch my love. I want you to catch... That spirit of sacrifice. If you don't catch these things from me, I cannot teach them to you. This is not mechanical. This is not mathematical. This is not putting a two plus two formula on the board. This is not writing it all down and giving you a, a textbook and saying, here's, here's commitment and here's love and here's devotion and here's duty, here's honor. It's got to come from in here. It's got to come from in here. 
And if you don't catch commitment in your heart and in your soul, it's not going to happen. I can't teach it to you. Once you catch commitment and you have that devotion to honor and duty and sacrifice, then of course God can use his word and his messenger to instruct us and to mature and, and to develop that which we have in our heart and we can, we can learn how to, how to be better and how to do better and how to fine tune. and uh, Yeah. But if you don't have the commitment in your heart, the rest of it is superfluous. It's meaningless. Commitment. This fellowship needs your commitment. The principles of liberty need your commitment. The Lord who saved us needs your commitment. If you don't catch that, Liberty Fellowship profits you nothing. All of our freedom that we enjoy profit you nothing. All the money and the prosperity and the wealth and the house and the retirement and all of that profits you nothing. If you don't have a commitment in your heart, to do whatever is necessary, whatever the duty is called, whatever it changes from day to day, week to week, month to month. What we are called to do changes all the time. What we, were, what we had to do last week may not, may not be what we need to do this week. The challenges are different. The opposition is different. The enemy is different. The opportunities are different. Everything changes. It's always in flux. Nothing remains the same. But it's that sense of honor and commitment in our heart that doesn't change. And whatever the situation is, whatever is called upon to do, we rise to the challenge and we do it because it's in here. Amen. If it's not in here, we're not going to know what to do. Well, I mean, last week we did this, but now, let's see, this week it's something, I, I don't know, I'm confused. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I thought we were doing it. No, 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 wait, wait, the enemy changed over here. The opposition is different over here now. Last week I was doing it, and now this week. No, wait, 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 wait. I, 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 yeah, okay, I would do that last week, but I don't think I want to do that this week. It, you think the devil is going to give you the same exact challenge? Week after week, month after month, year after year. I mean, look, just take a lesson from Washington, D.C., will you? Every day you turn on the news and they're coming at us from another direction. It's a different issue. It's a different person. It's a different set of circumstances, a different bill, it's a different ruling, it's a different executive order. It's, it changes all the time. But what doesn't change is in here. And whatever is necessary, whatever it takes to rise to the challenge today, what in here rises to the challenge and you do what you got to do. And you don't let excuses stop you. And you don't let problems stop you. And you don't let people stop you. And you don't let opposition stop you. Why? Because it's in here. You've caught it. Young Mahatma Gandhi attended a university in London and became almost convinced that Christianity was the one true religion, the one true faith. After graduating and still seeking the proof that Christianity was what he thought it was, the one true faith, he went to Africa, East Africa, and for seven months, 
he lived in the home of a Christian family. He thought that during that period he would discover the fulfillment of what he anticipated. His infatuation with Christianity would be confirmed. But after living seven months with this family, he saw nothing from them except indifference and apathy, laziness, lack of commitment. And Mahatma Gandhi wrote of his feelings at that time, and this is what he said. No, Christianity is not the one true supernatural belief I had hoped to find. It is a good religion, but just one more of the many religions in the world. Close quote. How would the history of India have been changed if one Christian family had enough commitment that it could be caught by somebody? Karl Marx, in his youth, was also infatuated with Christianity. He decided that he would go to a church service to see about what, see more about what Christianity was was had to offer. He went to a particular Sunday school class. The teacher of that class didn't bother to show up that Sunday. Neither did the teacher find a substitute to take the class for him. And there was nobody in the class to teach it. And Cara Mox left that church and said that Christianity was a joke and nobody really believed in it. How could the world have been changed if a Christian Sunday school teacher had had the commitment to show up to teach the class or at least get a a competent substitute to teach the class to show a young, impressionable Karl Marx Christianity was the real deal. Commitment is the necessary ingredient for the American who loves freedom, for the Christian who loves the Lord, for the person who loves truth. Commitment. I pray that those of us here at Liberty Fellowship will catch commitment from each other. I pray that those who are watching on the internet, who are searching for truth and who are looking for a body of believers who believe truth enough to have commitment to it, I pray that even as they watch long distance, over a camera and a computer or a television screen that they will be able to catch the commitment that is resident in the people of Liberty Fellowship. And I pray that as we march into the future, the next few weeks and months and years, here in the valley, and then 
even because of the outreach God has given us around the country, that people will catch the spirit of commitment that emanates from this place. Well, you're somewhat committed because you're here putting up with this hot weather and this. Uh, I'm just looking around, no air conditioning. I'm only, I only see three people asleep. That's not bad. What do you say, folks? You got to catch it. And if you catch it, Somebody else is going to catch it from you. I don't care who you are. What your role might be. You may not see yourself as influential. How many people will be influenced if one person catches your love for truth and liberty and the Lord? If one person, maybe a family member, maybe not, maybe someone else, maybe a friend, maybe someone that you don't even know, I'm convinced that collectively there are people all over the United States numbering into the tens and tens of thousands, maybe more than that, that are catching the spirit of commitment from Liberty Fellowship. If, you, if your life influences only one, there is no telling what God will do with that one person. There is no telling what they will do and who they will influence. But you first of all got to be sure that you've caught it. So I just want you to know my role and the way I see my role I, I'm, I'm trying to set myself on fire here every Sunday. And I want you to see it burn. And hopefully one of these Sundays you're going to go out of here and you're going to say, I've caught it. <laughs> I've caught it. I see it. I get it. And somebody's going to catch it from you. I can see a huge difference in the attitude of millions of people around the country today than I saw five years ago when I ran on the Constitution Party for President of the United States. I can see a huge difference. Huge difference. You say, well, most people still don't get it. Look, look. Everybody doesn't have to get it. Just enough. Enough have to get it. They thought, and I'll, I'm... I'll leave with this. I'm rambling now. This is all free, so. <laughs> they, 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 them. They thought 2013 was the year that they were going to disarm the American people. They really did. They thought the Newton School shootings out in Connecticut, Newtown, I guess it is, was going to be the catalyst that they were going to be able to ride the, ride the wave into Washington, D.C., and they were going to take the Second Amendment out of the American political scene. with not much help from our pastors and churches, unfortunately, 
tens of millions of freedom-loving Americans, Christians and non-Christians, let it be known in no uncertain terms, they were not going to let Washington, D.C. disarm them. And shock of all shocks, they couldn't even get the democratically controlled U.S. Senate to pass it. <laughs> Have they given up the fight? Of course not. Are they still coming after it? Yeah, they are. But they now know that this country is not going to disarm themselves in the face of any tyrant. They have got to go back to the drawing board. That's just one example. I've been flying extensively. I've been traveling a lot. The crowds are growing. The interest is growing. The awareness is growing. I am not discouraged. As long as there are people in this country, in our state, in our valley, who have caught in their hearts the spirit of truth, the spirit of freedom. Freedom and truth will never die. Let's stand for prayer.